nuclear energy to the miracle of flight. The 20th century ushered in a world of modernity the human race has never witnessed in recorded history. Pan Am defined the standard for luxury long-haul travel, with the naval uniforms, exciting destinations, and the jet airliner as the heart of the industry. Many aspects that made Pan Am so special also became its undoing. The company began as a modest move to bolster the U.S. presence in this Central American market in March 1927 to counter German influence over the Panama Canal through SCADA, a Colombian airline. Under the stewardship of Juan Tripp, Pan American Airways Corporation became the first international airline based in the United States, and the American government wanted it to grow. The Clipper era started in earnest in 1931. Pan Am introduced three Sikorsky S-40 flying boats. The fleet eventually grew to 28 aircraft, running services across the coastal Americas. Pan Am replaced the flyboy look of leather jackets and scarves with uniforms mimicking those of naval officers. The Sikorsky S-42 enabled Pan Am to enter the transoceanic market. In 1935, the airline began service from the west coast to Hong Kong. Other Asian routes followed shortly. Once the United States entered the war, the American military commandeered large parts of the Pan Am fleet for airlift duties. One of its most noteworthy contributions was helping develop a key supply route where aircraft, assorted vehicles, supplies, and personnel moved down from the United States to assembly points on the Brazilian northeast coast, then flew to West Africa. This logistical wonder played an unintended role in dragging Brazil into the war as well, as German submarines began targeting Brazilian vessels in retaliation for lending bases to the Allied war effort. When the guns fell silent in 1945, the airline market looked completely different from the pre-war days. Developments driven by wartime needs led to the dissemination of aircraft and airport infrastructure capable of long-range flights. Pan Am had the world at its feet, but if the possibilities were great, the demands for air travel outpaced them. Transworld Airways, better known as TWA, would emerge as its biggest rival under the stewardship of eccentric aviation legend Howard Hughes. Hughes engineered a marketing master plan for TWA, relying on the new Lockheed Constellation to make transatlantic services at speeds unmatched by the Pan Am DC-4. As the company grew through the 1950s, Juan Tripp became frustrated with the lack of innovation presented by new aircraft. While the general view among airline executives was that the stagnant but refined piston engines provided adequate performance and safety, Tripp refused to believe anything other than jets could sustain operations in the future. One of the staples of the Pan Am success was the inauguration of Worldport in 1960. Officially Terminal 3 of JFK Airport, the building became the heart of the operations to Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. The building had a distinctive saucer roof to shield passengers from the weather when boarding and deboarding. The company worked with IBM to develop the Panamac, a computer network that handled flight, hotel, and destination data. In 1963, Pan Am moved to the prestigious 200 Park Avenue building in Manhattan. In the late 60s, Pan Am posted almost unbelievable numbers. Its 150 jets moved over 6.5 million passengers yearly to destinations across 86 countries. You could say the 60s were the Pan Am golden days, but the deadly patterns had already taken root. Investments like Panamac remained grandiose but served a purpose, but other expenses are hard to call more than vanity buys. Pan Am spent $115.5 million just for the 25-year lease on 200 Park Avenue, then took out $135 million in loans to complete the building. Extravagance made the project run out of money in the final stretch. While having its own terminal is common practice for an airline as big as Pan Am, Worldport was decked in extravagance that exceeded functionality by a long shot. Along came 1973, and with it, King Faisal of Saudi Arabia spearheaded an oil embargo by OPEC against countries that sided with Israel in the Yom Kippur War. The move hit the United States particularly hard. 
and fuel costs skyrocketed. The oil crisis slashed demand for luxuries such as long-haul airline travel. For the first time, Pan Am had way more jets than it had demand for, and its operational costs had grown tremendously due to rising fuel costs. The oil crisis exposed many of Pan Am's organizational failures. But this was not the end of Pan Am's woes. The Airline Deregulation Act of 1978 had effectively stripped Pan Am of its last protections granted by the U.S. government. The new head of Pan Am, Thomas Sewell, set his sights on national airlines, hoping that absorbing its extensive domestic portfolio would change Pan Am's fortunes. The takeover was complete by 1980 without the expected result. Carnage tonight in the Scotland village of Lockerbie. A gruesome Christmas time disaster tonight. Disaster at Christmas. Pan Am 103 never makes it home. On December 21st, 1988, the Boeing 747-121 Clipper Maid of the Seas disintegrated over Scotland. The air crash investigation eventually pinpointed the cause as a bomb loaded in a suitcase stored in the forward cargo hold. The tragic loss of its crew, passengers, and aircraft preceded a series of federal investigations and lawsuits. The claim was that security failures from Pan Am enabled the bomb to be planted aboard the flight. The company countered that it had not been warned of heightened terrorism risks by federal agencies aware of them. While the Lockerbie investigation would drag on for many years, the public perception was decidedly against Pan Am. In January 1991, the company filed for bankruptcy. Delta Airlines picked up most of the pieces, including the World Port and JFK Airport, and purchased 45% stake in Pan Am. The other 55% went to outstanding creditors. The final clipper in the sky was Pan Am Flight 436, a Boeing 727-200 from Barbados to Miami. Could Pan Am have been saved? Maybe, but it's unlikely. Most of what we consider the golden era of air travel is based on the image put forth by Pan Am during its peak in the early jet age. The Pan Am model focusing on luxurious long haul operations is rare, but still has its own followers. Over 43% of Emirates operations follow the same format Pan Am pioneered, and the same goes for 34% of Qatar Airways. These airlines make most of their earnings by bringing passengers to their hubs in Dubai and Doha before taking them to their final destinations. They are arguably the leading companies in connecting the western and eastern halves of the globe. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more, let us know in the comments. Please consider sending some support via YouTube or our Patreon membership for as little as three bucks a month. You'll get bonus footage and other perks of being a wallflower. I appreciate you tuning in. From Minerva and myself, take care of yourself and take care of each other.